and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the What is Decoloniality speaker series. And um, I just want to introduce myself and my co panelists and then say a little bit about the event today. Uh, first of all, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Carter Mathis, I'm Associate or Assistant Director of the Rutgers Advanced Institute of Critical Caribbean Studies. I'm also Associate Professor and Associate Chair in the English Department here at Rutgers. I work on African American literature, Caribbean literature, African diaspora studies, uh, sound and, uh, and music. Um, and that work can be seen in my first book, Imagine the Sound, as well as a book I'm currently working on, Ecologies of Funk. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce uh, all of the panelists, and then we will begin a com the first part of the session, which is a conversation uh, between myself, um, Amanda, and Pedro, who I will introduce you to in a second, with um, Marta and Mari Cruz. We're waiting on Marta right now. Hopefully she will be arriving shortly. One other logistical note just for everyone to um, pass along that uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres, the director of Rakes, sends his regrets not being able to be here, put a lot of effort and energy into making this happen, but unforeseen circumstances kept him from being with us today. Um, Amanda Gonzalez Izquierdo is a PhD student in the program in comparative literature here at Rutgers. She's also our research assistant in Rakes. Her research concerns are broadly situated in 20th and 21st century French philosophy and in the theory and literature of the Caribbean and its diaspora during the same time period. She's primarily interested in ontological and phenomenological declarations of identity and relation in decolonial epistemologies. She's currently researching decolonial witnessing and working through a notion of witnessing as a decolonial ethics that unsettles the foundational violence of coloniality and establishes an otherwise where we care for and defend the dead while by and through co-signing the possibility for humanity of oppressed peoples facing interlocking oppression. Pedro Lebron Ortiz is self-identifying as a former mechanic and currently a mechanical engineer. I would also add a philosopher. Um, he is also our inaugural Rakes thought leader, which is a distinction we pat we um, kind of uh, convey to someone who's uh, to distinguish to someone whose work combines sophisticated explorations and elaborations of ideas and effective conversations um, and collaborations with community leaders. And um, Pedro's research agenda currently revolves around four main areas of interest, marinage, suicide, temporality, and science and technology, undergirded by a broader interest in colonization and decolonization. He's the author of the book Philosophia del Simoronaje, Philosophy of Marinage, which was published uh, last year um, with Editoria Educación Emergente. Currently, he's working on a second book project entitled Matarse en la Colonia, To Kill Oneself in the Colony, uh, in which he attempts to grapple with the relationship between racial capitalism, colonization, suicide, depression, intimate partner violence and narco culture in the context of Puerto Rico. Um, I should say too that Pedro has uh, been in dialogue with our, our distinguished guests, Marta and, and Marie Cruz, as you will gather at, from the conversation as it develops. Uh, I will, I'm gonna go ahead and, and also introduce both Marta and Mari Cruz now. And um, as I said, we're waiting on, on Marta, um, but I'll go ahead and tell you about her now. Uh, Dr. Marta Moreno Vega is the author of When the Spirits Dance Mambo, Growing Up in New Yorkian 
in El Barrio and the Altar of My Soul, The Living Traditions of Santeria. She is also co-editor of Women, Women Warriors of the Afro-Latina Diaspora and director of the Creative Justice Initiative. She was recently awarded the 2020 Latina Trailblazer uh, Pionera Honore Prize. And let me now introduce Mari Cruz. Mari Cruz Rivera Clemente is a community leader intellectual and founder of Cooperacion Pinones de Integra, uh, COPI, a community organization with more than 10 years um, of history located in the majority Afro-Puerto Rican community of Pinones Loiza. She is also a doctoral candidate in the Beatriz La Salle Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Puerto Rico. I wanted to just say a bit about their, the collaboration uh, between these two distinguished guests. Um, and that can kind of then lead us into our, uh, our conversation, the first stages of our conversation. So Dr. Moreno Vega presides, who, as I said, presides over the Creative Justice Initiative and Mari Cruz who presides over Colpi um, joined forces in 2018 to create Corredor Afro, which is really kind of the, the basis of our, our meeting today, this work around Corredor Afro. Corredor Afro seeks to contribute to Afro-descendant struggles for liberation and decolonization in Puerto Rico, but also across the entire spectrum of the African diaspora. The collaboration between the Creative Justice Initiative and COPI combines the strengths of projects that have been born in Puerto Rico, as well as in Puerto Rican, the Puerto Rican diaspora in the stateside US, breaking with strict ethno-nationalist views of liberation and emancipation. By focusing on the question of blackness, Corridor Afro confronts anti-black racism head on. And by providing access to cultural, artistic, and intellectual, as well as philosophical resources, programming and engagements, it provides an example of what it is to be grounded in communities that are both local as well as transnational. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, we're approaching this conversation along the lines of, well, there's a couple of things, you know, this is an ongoing conversation uh, between Marta, Mari Cruz, um, Nelson, who's not here, myself, Pedro, Amanda, and others around questions of um, fighting anti-Black racism, spirituality, and community work. And there are other installments, I think, of, um, you know, aspects of this conversation, you know, to look forward to ahead in Rake's programming. And the second thing I wanted to say is that we see this conversation really in the spirit of um, an intellectual project I think that's important to Rakes, which is uh, an ongoing project of decolonizing knowledge and specifically thinking through and beyond the currently dominant paradigms of the arts and sciences and the humanities. Um, and a lot of that thinking through and beyond really having to do, I think, with investments in kind of organic uh, community-based knowledge production. Um, so with that, I think we could begin. I was a little confused by the way the questions were asked. So I'm assuming that you're looking at different periods of mm -hmm. uh, Mighty's development and my development yes. as um, builders of organizations. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me the first question about the Yoruba concept, this refers to an article I wrote several years ago. Yes. And as uh, the second director of Enrico del Barrio, as a developer of the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, 
obviously my growth has been traveling to different locations, seeing how I see myself, right? In, in the family of the diaspora and understanding that there are threads that connect us across um, whatever countries we're in and mm -hmm. we were forcibly taken to. And it's important to understand that uh, enslavement actually ends very late in the process. And people talk about enslavement as if it was a long time ago. In Puerto Rico, 1873, Cuba, 1880, Brazil, 1888. Which means that the tradition that uh, our people brought, the cultures that were brought from different ethnic groups are still alive and well in our various communities. Uh, we still see uh, ancient languages spoken. When I did the conference in Ileife, um, it was very clear that a lot of what had left, forcibly left through enslavement, exists in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Let's say the, uh, different rituals, different chants, different um, ways of understanding the energy of the hunter exists more in Brazil than it did in Ife, which is the birthplace of the Yoruba people. Mm -hmm. So that what the understanding is, is that we are still early in our scholarship as people of African descent, looking at the world through a vision that reflects that historical knowledge that our people brought into what is today the Americas. And that this knowledge predates sacred beliefs of the Europeans, right? And see uh, the sacred in a very different context than the European oppressor abroad into the Americas. So that when we're talking about Asia, we're talking about a force of life. We're talking about the ability to make things happen, the power to make things happen. And if you look at our people, wherever they were forcibly taken, that power is alive and well. The question is problematic to me. Can I speak about um, yeah. integrated and synthetic? Synthetic means false, mm -hmm. right? And it surprised me to see that, uh, that, that word in the question because synthetic means either it's put together falsely or it's a replacement of the original. The traditions that we bring, the traditions that our people hold dear still predate European traditions. They can be compared. And this question attempts to compare it from a Eurocentric point of view. And that's problematic. Ashe is the force of life. It's the ability to make things happen. We all carry that ability. The issue is, do we put it into manifestation and how we put it into manifestation? Our people in their brilliance uh, forced themselves to labor when they were abused because they were preparing for us. Because without their taking a stand, we would not be here. So that that's the force of Ashe. It's the will to survive when you weren't supposed to survive. It's the willingness to do when you're not supposed to do. So that Ashe, and if you go to Brazil, if you go to Cuba, if you go to Trinidad, you go to Haiti, you go to the Bronx, in Puerto Rico, our people have maintained that willingness, that force of life, that will to live. And that's why we're here, because they insisted on the will to live. And the basis for organizing, you know, the questions are from an outside in. And the first thing we have to learn is that academia has shown us a manner of seeing ourselves as the other through our false scholarship and misinformation. So that I find the questions problematic. I don't know about Mari, but I find them problematic because these questions could have come from somebody outside of our communities rather than from within our communities. As scholars, we need to see ourselves as part of our communities. We need to understand that um, we are learning from our communities. That the scholarship that you're studying in books is still nascent. 
And it's Nathan because most of the scholarship comes from people outside of our communities that went to places to gather information, not even speaking the language of those places and not understanding the communities that they were going into. And many of the scholars in the early period uh, that did documentation were generally Christians and reverends and, uh, and people from a, a Christian denomination, even if they were African. So their job was to demonize, right? What they saw. And in that demonization, right? Do you come words, with, with words like fetishes, fetishism, and another word that was used, phenomenology, that was used in one of the questions. Phenomenology means looking at the strange, looking at the surprising other. And I'm not the surprising other. Our people are not the surprising other. These traditions are grounded in our DNA. You can go any place where our people are and these traditions exist, including the South. So that uh, we have to learn as scholars to speak differently, to speak in a manner that when you go into what is your community, because if you're Black, if you're Latino, if you're um, from our people, then act like our people and talk like our people. Not use language that our people can't understand because it becomes theoretical. It doesn't become actual. Theory and practice are hand in hand. And the notion, the theory uh, is, is practice or somehow gives you a better understanding than practice does, right, is incorrect. If you're not immersed in the work that you're doing in the communities that you are part of and are talking about and are speaking on, then you're the other. Color doesn't make you uh, Afrocentric in your thinking, right? And depending on how you define as a Latino is how you also see because uh, white Latinos, right? Or passing white Latinos are as supremacist and as racist as any other. So Latino doesn't make you lacking racism, right? There are Afro Latinos, indigenous Latinos, right? So that you need to define who you're talking about when you say Latino. I like to refer to myself as Afro-Latina to make it very clear that of the space that I come from and the vision that I bring. When you have a cultural group, is a people that have practiced whatever they believe in, whatever they see, whatever they understand for better than a hundred years. So that means that a cultural group has a certain way of understanding the world. And in understanding that world, your creativity comes from understanding that world. This is why I wrote the article because my point of view after traveling in many places where our people are is that we see the world from a certain point of view. We honor nature, nature is sacred, right? Amadi was out this morning and yesterday uh, confronting bulldozers because they were tearing down a whole, um, a finca full of palm trees, full of land, right? That for us is sacred. The forest is sacred. It's a spiritual presence. You can't live without earth, right? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, people make it like it's something out of this world. No, 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 you need air to breathe. And what circulates air if it's not nature, right? So that when you talk about culture, that's when you can talk about music that comes from that culture, the dance that comes from that culture, the visual uh, that come from that culture, the writing that comes from that culture, because it's grounded. Like in Gugi Wationgo says, culture is the grounding, it's the foundation of who you are. And if that culture doesn't look like you, it doesn't reflect you, then you have a problem. You have an identity problem. You have a problem because you don't know where you fit, mm -hmm. right? So many of our young scholars or old scholars try to act so uh, Eurocentric in their vision of, of us, right? And replicate a European model that's miseducation. So that our job and our task now is to reframe and look at an education 
that is grounded in our principles, in our ethics, and in our learning uh, experience that has survived the, the greatest Holocaust known to man and, and womankind. Primero, uh, for me, es, es bien importante que entendamos el contexto donde estamos. Eh, el trabajo del corredor afro eh, esas ausencias que hemos tenido por siglos, las comunidades negras, las comunidades afrodescendientes. Así que entendiendo primero la comunidad donde estamos y todo lo que Marta ha explicado en su, en todo lo que ella ha presentado esta noche, eh, la cultura que tenemos, que está en nuestra comunidad, no está alejada de lo que es nuestra ecología, lo que es nuestra espiritualidad lo que son esos espacios de lucha, de mucha resistencia. Así que el trabajo del corredor afro empieza eh, desde esa base comunitaria, desde ese entendimiento de la comunidad y transmite, pero no solamente nuestros saberes, sino que recoge los saberes de la comunidad y los circula y los comparte. Así que para nosotros el trabajo y nosotras con los, con los niños, con las niñas. El trabajo de nosotros con niños es, es, es importantísimo y Mari siempre está este, enfocando en que tenemos que tener niños presentes, ¿verdad? Y, y yo, obviamente estoy de acuerdo porque las dos somos maestras. De las dos empezamos nuestra carrera como maestra, pero entendemos que no es maestra solamente en la escuela, es maestra 24-7. Y en ese proceso este, incluimos programas y tenemos que incluir programas para niños y adultos y young people porque estamos este, en una comunidad ¿verdad? y esa comunidad tiene que estar reflejada en, en el, el, correo, el corredor laco. Eso no es tener una parte de la comunidad y no la otra. Es total tener la parte y servir toda la comunidad. The important thing to understand is that I was brought up in New York. My parents were born in Loisa, and my mother was born in, uh, my father was born in Loisa, my mother was born in Caguas. So I'm a New York Rican. Mari was born in Piñoni and has grown up in Piñoni. So when we start communicating, I'm a professor at NYU bringing my students to, New, uh, to Puerto Rico. And the idea was, um, as a teacher of, of public policy, art and public policy, was for our young people to see how under a colonial structure, right, oppressive structure, artists continue to have voice. Artists continue to create. And in that process, um, I brought my students to a copy, right, because um, I felt that Mari was building an Afrocentric institution as I had built one in New York, the Caribbean Cultural Center. And in the work that I did with the Caribbean Cultural Center, we did conferences in Argentina. Mari went to Argentina with us um, because generally speaking in Argentina, no one speaks about uh, black presence. Argentina has black presence, like Mexico has black presence, right? So in an uh, international conferences I was putting together, uh, we were looking at uh, the kind of activism that was happening in the different places. 
And so through that work, Mari and I understand that we have a similar vision and a similar way of looking at the world and um, focus on institution building and the importance of institution building and having places, safe spaces for our young people, our young scholars, our elder scholars to um, grow their work and have the freedom to think critically, not from um, a space, a colonial space that is the university, right? Because if you think about it, universities began to look at Caribbean studies and Africana studies in the 60s and 70s, when I, as a young student, very much like you are now, we took over boards of higher education insisting that there be black and Caribbean studies and Latino studies, right? So that it's relatively new that you have these departments. And one of the things that we both seemed um, to agree upon and, and observe is that even the education in these divisions and in these departments are very structured, not to expand knowledge, but to centralize knowledge. Mm -hmm. And our role is to expand knowledge, is to look at areas that have not been looked at, is to give our scholars, young people, the freedom to explore areas that have not been explored. Because uh, my point of view, and I believe that Maddie's as well, is that scholarship is still very nascent because most of our scholars, um, we don't even have many tenured scholars, right? We, in the Latino, uh, in the Afro-Latino, in the Caribbean, and in, in, in Africana studies. And, you know, so, I mean, just as I'm attacking uh, the Eurocentricity of universities, also the racism of universities that always have our scholars at some point of you're gonna be dismissed, <laughs> right? Because you don't have tenure. And so, Although I've gone through the college system, I've gone through the university system, I did my doctorate thanks to Malefe Asante, and I always praise him because that was the only department that I fit. Uh, I was in the, I had gotten a full scholarship to Columbia University to the cultural anthropology division. And when I understood that anthropology, right, which most of our young people go into, cultural anthropology is looking at the other and understanding the other through a framework right, that is very Eurocentric, I uh, turned in my scholarship and said I would not look at my other people through the lenses like if I wasn't part of that community. So that we need to find spaces and create spaces that honor the knowledge that is within our communities, that is the knowledge that has to be um, minded, if you will, uh, because our communities have so much information and so much knowledge that is not being looked at, not being understood and not being incorporated. And then, um, as I said before, our scholars, our scholars begin to use frameworks that are foreign to us and should not be applied to us. You know, uh, the philosophy of phenomenology, uh, absolutely not, right? But that's a word that it's in one of the questions. Um, synthetic for the, if, uh, you know, and, what does that mean in terms of Ashe? How does one even apply that word to a concept of, of force of life and force of nature? So that what I'm saying is we have to be critical. We're all guilty of using these frameworks that we have learned that are not don't serve us and don't serve our getting the information and knowledge and sharing that knowledge and get in doing the writing that we need to write us as emerging scholars and scholars. For all the attendees, please do use the Q&A function um, to ask your own questions and um, we'll dedicate the, the last bit of this webinar to um, answering whatever questions you have. Apologize for the technical, and I know that Maddie's having technical uh, difficulties in Piñones because we need to understand that the uh, internet structure in many of our communities is weak. And Piñones is one of those communities that if a plane flies by or the wind hits too quick, uh, you lose communication. And throughout the world, our children are falling behind and our adults are falling behind because they don't have access to the internet. And internet is how you learn and how you're moving in the world now with technology. 
So that one of the areas that has to be looked at by our young scholars and our scholars is why are those services so wanting in our communities, right? When this is what education going in now and into the future is going to require and our communities don't have adequate connections. I think that, um, you know, my, my form of being right after I understood how deep and profound uh, racism is embedded, right? Because it's systemic. It's in the educational school system. It's in the university. It's in jobs. It's systemic. It's throughout. And I guess that's the fever, right, of building institutions. Because when I understood that as director, second director of Enrico de Barrio, I was like, wherever I go, that's going to be present. And the question is, do I want to be present in places that don't want me present? And maybe that's my, I think it's my mother and my father's teaching, you know? Porque santo que no te quiere, con no resale basta, was the same, right? So you don't want me in your place, I'll create my own space. Now I have to attend your space in order to get that, those pieces of paper, right? And actually when I turned in my scholarship at Columbia, uh, Molefe called me and he said, no, you're coming to Temple. I said, no, I'm not, I'm done. And he's not, I want you to have that piece of paper because when you have that piece of paper, people will call you doctor. Right now they're calling you a community leader and that's wonderful and that's great, but I want them to call you doctor. So you are coming, right? And I did. I went to Philadelphia and I got my doctorate. I did global research, I did it. But that doesn't take away the fact that these institutions continue to be racist. And it is uh, to their advantage to be racist. Mm -hmm. right? So that you can't divorce Puerto Rico from what happened January 6th at the Capitol in Washington. You can't divorce St. Thomas, you can't divorce Brazil, you can't divorce any of the places we're at from what happened January 6th in Washington. Because that shows you the level of racism that is not only in the United States, but it's global, okay? Almost mm -hmm. any place you look, the people that are dying the most from COVID is our people and native peoples. And that's by intent, that's genocide. So the case of Puerto Rico is similar. How is it that Piñones does not have a school? How is that possible in 2021 that a community doesn't have a school? And people kind of, oh, it doesn't have a school, oops. Now, if it was a white community, there would be a school. Mm -hmm. Right? But it's a black community. Right? So, you know, going through, I guess, a, a, a philosophy of um, combined cimarronaje and um, insisting on your space and insisting on your rights and resisting on your justice, you build your own. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you build your place. And you build a place where people can be safe to think. Because if you're gonna, you can't think and you can't analyze and you can't critically see your condition, then you can't destroy racism, discrimination and all that comes with it. It's a negotiation. It's a constant negotiation. Because when a policeman decided to put his knee on a man and he was videotaped, right? I'm listening to the trial daily and he was videotaped, right? And he still did it, right? And now we're going through a trial that's trying to say, did you see what you saw? Mm -hmm. you really see what you saw. And that's also the case of Puerto Rico, right? Who are the poorest? Who are the more in jail? Who do not finish 
their education because of conditions that have been created that forced them not to co complete their education, right? So that I think we need to talk about our reality in from a different perspective, that it's intentional. And what are we gonna do about that intentionality? What it is the capacity that we have as a community? That's why community is so important and culture is so important because mm -hmm. there are lessons there that tells us how to create our own food, right? It, mm -hmm. There are lessons there that tells us how to live in community that si tu no tiene, I'll share my food with you in the el otro día, you share your food with me. So there are certain ethics and values that are created within community, right? That a society that's trying to make you less and say that there's not enough for you is rendered incapable of teaching that and passing that on. And our homes are educational places, as well as places like El Corredor are educational places. And we have to understand that it's that. Because the system, right, doesn't put a school in. So what do we do? Say, oh, there's no school. And what's next? So I like the Nike commercial. The Nike commercial said, just do it. Once you understand what's happening, just do it. <laughs> Right. The Schomburg is in Kopi. Before it was in, in Corredor Lafra, right? Because we built Corredor Lafra just two years ago. People act, talk about us like if we're around forever. No, we're just two years old. We're a baby. Um, Manny has if they, a plaque for Schomburg, Avenida Schomburg, right? and so on. And why? Because anybody that looks at the work of Schomburg understands, one, he called for departments of Africana studies first, before anyone, before the boys, right? Uh, Afro-Puerto Rican, Afro-Caribbean. Um, and I understood when I built the Caribbean Cultural Center, and that's when I fell in love with Arturo Schomburg, I was reading, I had just uh, decided to leave Columbia University. And I went to the Schomburg Library and pulled out a file on uh, Schomburg. And there was a letter from Schomburg to Nicolas Guillén. And I was just beginning to build the Caribbean Culture Center. And in that letter to Nicolas Guillén, he said, mi hermano, Nicolas, va Langston Hughes, mi hermano, afroamericano, va pa Cuba. Quiero que conozca the Afro community in Cuba. Mm. That's a letter. And I was sitting there and, you know, um, trying to sort of figure out, you know, how I was going to frame the Caribbean Cultural Center. And that letter was everything. It was everything. Porque dije yo, si Schomburg con todo su trabajo por carta, mandándole carta, a su network, estaba moviendo esta inteligencia afrocentric, ¿verdad? ¿Cómo es que ahora yo con todo lo que tengo, ¿verdad? Eh, tengo acceso a coger un avión y brincar en un avión y ir a Brasil o ir a IPE o do whatever, right? No cojo esta oportunidad to frame the Caribbean Cultural Center as, a, as an international organization, right? Mm -hmm. So that we understand Schomburg is being local, right? Because he's Puerto Rican, was an independentista, like, you know, uh, pero his work was international, right? He started local, that Puerto Rico had to be independent. He was part of the independence movement with Cubans, right? And, and, and other Latinos in the United States when he went to, to New York. But then he went totally international in terms of his scholarship. So I said, that's how we build. We build local and we build internationally. We have to see the local and the reality local, but that local reality, we need to connect international. And international needs to come back local, right? And that's what El Corredor is, right? Mm -hmm. It's that connection. It's that uh, lifeline between local and international to understand ourselves. Double consciousness, what is double consciousness? Why do you need mm -hmm. it? Because you need to navigate the world of the paper, 
<laughs> you know, of the pat right. on the head saying, oh, you got your doctorate. But, you know, what do you do with the doctorate? You use it when you need to use it. It's a right. weapon like any other weapon, right? It's a hammer. Like if, if you need to a hammer to nail something, well, the hammer is what you need, right? If mm -hmm. you need to open a door for some educational process or framing something, you use your doctorate. That's why mm -hmm. you want it. Mm -hmm. Not because it makes you smarter, it doesn't. I know a lot of doctorates who are stupid, right? We know that. <laughs> but they got their doctor right so that does not give you intelligence what gives you intelligence is your community and your culture as an institution we're two years old and um, people who have built within our communities Mari has better than 20 years was born in Pignone um, I was born in New York, and one of the things that brings us together is because in the barrio, um, the deficiency of everything that was provided by government uh, is similar to what is happening in Piñones and Luisa. So that uh, what you do is you do it with whatever resources you have. You know, you can't frame uh, questions without saying, how do I contribute? Do I contribute uh, any money to these institutions that are doing this work? But I expect them to do the work, right? We do it because we go out and meet with people. We talk to people. Um, we develop our, uh, programs in, institute, in, in, the, in, in the organization, let's say, that brings in people. Um, Maddie was out stopping bulldozers from destroying uh, land yesterday and today both of us were out there when we realized that we had to be out there there were community people out there um speaking to the press you know we're all using our connections and our networks telling people you know write to the alcaldesa of loisa and say you know how do you allow right this destruction of land when people don't even have a permit and your people, your community doesn't even know who's there tearing up their land, right? And you're selling land that is sacred, the land that um, is holding back the river, right? Because right now, because climate change, and this is something that we have to put front and center, already communities like Tocones and, and different areas in Piñones, water is coming in, people have to move. So that the work that any of us do, has to connect to what's happening to the issues that are happening within our communities. And whatever community you're in, you have to identify what those issues are and work with your community because you are the community. I thank you for your service because I know that this year must have been something unreal for you. And I can't understand that my, my daughter-in-law is a nurse and I, I just praise her every day for the work that she's doing. I think that one of the things that uh, we've been looking at is the medicinal knowledge that exists within our communities. My grandma siempre tenía colado for something. I, uh, botella de alcoholado filled with leaves, you know, este, uh, para cuando uno tenía fiebre, una botella to you drink if you had a stomach ache and so on and so forth. So this knowledge of now called or, organic, right? Uh, foods and organic this and organic that and vegetarian this and a vegetarian that. I am a vegetarian. And um, that knowledge is knowledge that our elders possess. So I think that any healthcare worker should also connect to those natural healing processes that are within our communities um, because they work. Um, my cousin just cracked me up the other day because she says, ay, yo tenía un dolor y mi, mi amiga me dijo que comprara ay bendito. And I thought she was kidding around. I said, ay bendito, you're kidding. And she says, no, te compré un pote. And she's it's a face to tie me with, with a, a photo of ay bendito. That's a medicine. And I'm dying to get the bottle to see what the ingredients are in it because I've never heard of Ivendita except like all of us say it, right? But um, I think that there is natural healing medicines within our community 
that um, bring knowledge and bring, you know, ways of healing and understanding uh, healing. And um, that may be an area that she would like to explore as well as the official uh, strand, right? What resonates with you? I mean, are you a Jamaican? That's the first question I would ask. How grounded are you in your community? Um, I don't like the idea of people coming and looking at me. I like the idea of experience, people having an experience and learning about uh, the community. So we, last year before COVID had, um, Dr. Samuel Cruz brought his students from Union Theological Seminary at Columbia University, and they did service. They, they um, organized programs. Um, they uh, organized interreligious spiritual programs to understand the spirituality of the community. So that they came uh, not as tourists, but they came to learn as an educational experience. So I think that rather than use tourism, I would think about how do you develop cultural educational uh, experiences that inform people of what your people have preserved, what your people have done in the world. And Jamaica has been a tremendous force in the world. Um, I think that that conference that we organized in IFE was very important. Uh, we took better than 100 people, and we took 100 people from different parts of the diaspora. So we took people from Brazil, Cuba, Santo Domingo, you know, uh, Trinidad, Jamaica, and we took people with different intelligences, right, uh, from scholarship to uh, spirituality. And the idea was to have these exchanges to see what had been sustained in Africa and the diaspora. And one of the things is because of lack of miseducation and misinformation is that we assume that all the answers are in Africa, forgetting that Africa was colonized as well as the us in the diaspora. So that many of the traditions that we believe and we know came from uh, our root traditions in Africa because of colonialism and the imposition of Catholicism, Protestantism, Muslim, and other traditions, right? Many people hid their traditional cultures and traditional practices. So when we um, brought in people from Brazil and people from Cuba, there was ancient knowledge that is preserved in the diaspora that no longer exist in Africa. So that what that taught me was that the process of exchange is essential. Because I'll give you one incident. Uh, Amaya de Santo from Brazil, who had uh, initiated into the Yoruba Candomblé tradition of, of Brazil, and was a priestess of Yemaya, and Yemaya is the water goddess, the mother of the ocean and mother of uh, 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 the spiritual mother of us all, right? Um, we went to Abiekuta, which is the birthplace of Yemaya, and um, the spirit, right? The spirit uh, was manifested there. And she tried to speak in English to other women that were there dressed in blue in the colors of Yemaya. And she just kept talking and talking and talked in, in Portuguese, the little English she knew. And they didn't respond to her. She started singing, chanting a ritual to Yemaya. Everyone in that room froze. I mean, froze, I'm not being dramatic, froze and started crying because those were songs that they remember their grandparents sung. They were no longer sung in Abiyaguta. So she brought, right, an expression, a ritual, uh, a song, a chant that no longer was in Africa. The spirit of the hunter, Ochosi, 
many people in Africa, in West Africa, in the Yoruba community that we visited, didn't remember Ochosi. We took a priest of Ochosi, not knowing that Ochosi was no longer a popular spirit in, in Africa. And that initiate, right, from Trinidad was able to inform and reintroduce the concept, right? So what that says is what I started with. We haven't begun to scratch the surface of the work that needs to be done. And we can't limit it to subjects that academia uh, sort of pushes you through and pushes you to because there is writing on it. You have to create the writing. You have to create the questions and the investigation because that work is not yet documented. That work is not yet captured. And we have to do that before the elders leave us. We have to do that before the elders leave us, right? And I think the question before was something about ancestors. We all have ancestors. George Washington is an ancestor. Lincoln is an ancestor, except it isn't yours. So that this, the way that the questions frame ancestors is also uh, one thing and incorrect. We all have ancestors. Ancestors basically is those people who are now spirit. Whoever is not actual in me, right? Or you can pitch is an ancestor. Now, how you access the information that that ancestor brought to the world is critical because you need to, to interview your grandmother, your elders, to make sure that that knowledge is preserved and it doesn't go with them, right? And within our communities, especially Latino and Indian and, and um, African communities, our elders not, not, uh, didn't write it down. They just memorize it, right? So that if we don't capture it in the work that we're doing, it's gonna be gone. It's going to be gone. So that's our responsibility. Uh, that's our responsibility to capture that information before they're no longer here. Okay, and we are, we're right at, at 7.30 now, which is technically the, um, the conclusion. But I just wanted to say a couple of uh, concluding, not really remarks, but just points. One, that um, to just thank everyone for their presence today, for the interventions, the contributions. And on that note, to say that, you know, Nelson and I at least have talked about this being maybe a part one of a conversation that will be. Um, ongoing in different manifestations and, you know, in a direct way, perhaps there can be a, um, a second uh, conversation similar to this one that can pick up, I think, on a lot of the productive ideas and threads that were uh, spoken on today. And that, I mean, for instance, I was just thinking about in the last comments, a lot of focus on uh, on spirituality and belief and knowledge and the framings of, of belief and knowledge that comes from within communities and in kind of in resistance to how um, those forms of belief are, are kind of treated and categorized by the academy, by um, the West, by forms, structures based on systemic racism. So thinking a lot more about belief and knowledge. And I think also uh, something we didn't talk about directly, but was there in different ways, uh, healing and the connections between different ideas of healing, both in a, you know, an er you know, a sense of, of actual tools, herbal tools of healing in communities, but also healing as like a concept that for many people is hand in hand with forms of, of resistance. Those are just two things that you know came to my mind, but there's so many other, I think, topics that we've just started to touch on that we can certainly converse more about. And um, I would just, in concluding, welcome uh, Pedro and Marta 
and Amanda to say any um, last comments as well. And uh, I'll just end mine now by once again, thanking everyone for their presence and contributions. Okay. Eh, Marta, siempre es un, un placer este, poder entrar en conversación con ustedes, contigo y con Maricruz. Así que gracias. Estoy bien agradecido por estar aquí, compartir este espacio virtual, pero tú sabes, siempre aprendo un montón de ustedes. Thank you for walking me through the techie part. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I really don't. That never happened before. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, everyone. This has been such a, a powerful and generative conversation. And um, I see that, that we had people from all over the world. So I, it's one of those great things about meeting in a virtual space is that even, even though we can't, um, it, it's a different form of connection. It, it can invite more people and, and have a more global conversation. Um, so thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you being here and definitely stay connected to Corredor Afro and, and to the work of, of Pedro Lebron Ortiz and, and the work that we'll be doing at the Rutgers Advanced Institute for Critical Caribbean Studies. Um, we'll continue to be talking about decoloniality and, and inviting you to events that will have such um, powerful presentations as this. Um, so thank you. It's a shame that Marit Cruz can't be here for, for this last bit. I, but, I just put in the chat, um, uh, a link that Nelson sent me, which is, I believe it's an interview, Pedro, with uh, with Marta and Marie Cruz. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so for those in the audience, if you wanted to copy that, that link real quick to have uh, another resource to learn, you know, more um, about some of the topics, you know, to, to hear some more about the topics that have been discussed today, you may want to uh, grab that that link and check out the interview. What I would like to say is thank you. And uh, for Marie Cruz and I, you know, to uh, share what we're doing is always wonderful. And to get feedback is always wonderful. And I think that if we're going to continue having a conversation, I would like to suggest that we be begin to use different and create different frameworks from those that are colonial in their perspective and otherness in their perspective, like phenomenology in terms of a concept that was developed in 1905, I think, uh, it, effective in, in terms of like um, our work is emotional as opposed to critical analysis. So that we begin to look at a narrative, right? That's intentional a narrative that centers our experience and uh, decenters that which has oppressed us. And if we don't do it, then it will continue to be replicated in future generations that are doing this work. And I think as you're saying too, it's, it's very important to, in doing so, shifting the terms, you know, also, um, critically like uh showing indeed kind of what, what you're saying you know the the genesis of the terms that are problematic and why they are so uh as part of you know kind of reframing the conversation um so i think that you know those interventions are are well heard and and welcome now that's critical. If we don't change the dynamic of narrative meaning and definition, then mm -hmm. you're um, just walk. It's like a tail following its it, it, itself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Walking okay. in the shadow of of others' footsteps. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. <laughs>